I think drag is a very wide spectrum. Drag is the quintessential queer art form. Drag is very much not for sissies. <laughs> the most general definition I can think of is the exploration of gender through performance. When someone of one gender dresses as the other as a costume, as a thing they enjoy doing. <laughs> From the very rough and crude and kind of fabulous to something that's very refined. I think there's some sort of idea of a fantastical change to your persona. You see some of these people taking on this whole new character. It can be completely different to what they are in real life. We all walk through the world trying to figure out who we are and how to be and how to be accepted. And so we're all doing a bit of performance in one way or another. Drag is something each of us do every single day. The idea of altering your mindset about how you look and how you are. Whether it's putting on a suit and tie to go to the office, whether it's putting on a uniform, whether it's presenting a face to the world that doesn't necessarily reflect how you feel on the inside. That's all drag. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Nasty little boys. You came here for some excitement tonight, and that's just what you're going to get. Drag is an incredibly diverse thing. There are so many ways to do it. You have your sort of classic Vegas showgirl, what they call passing. Give me a break, it's still under construction. And then you've got a sort of more punk side of drag. They're doing makeup and hair, but it's not really about looking like a real woman. Just get your hair done tomorrow and you'll feel better. That's what I always do when I get depressed. I think it's a dangerous thing to too closely elide sexuality with drag. They're very different things. I'm not crowding you, am I? Oh, it's nice and cozy. Over the years, drag has been portrayed on film in, in a real kind of love-hate way. I think it's easier for audiences to find the humor in straight guys having to wear dresses. That was the cornerstone of Milton Berle's TV show in the 1950s. We wouldn't be caught dead with men. Rough, hairy beasts, eight hands. The first time I saw drag in a movie would have to have been Some Like It Hot. Well, Something Like It Hot is a classic. It is one of the all-time great comedies. Hi! I'm the bass fiddle, just call me Daphne! Hi! Part of the joke of Some Like It Hot is that you have these two sort of ungainly gentlemen having to then become these feminine creations. It's so unapologetic. Billy Wilder was just Oh, the most brilliant anarchic artist. His movies don't date at all. I mean, the fact you wonder, oh my God, they would never do that in a movie today. Now you have done it. Done what? You tore off one of my chests. I don't know if I would call it drag so much as like a disguise. They're not doing it as an art form or as some sort of identity exploration. They're doing it as a disguise. You're gonna meet a millionaire, a young one. What makes you so sure? <laughs> My feminine intuition. Drag is more often than not treated as a comedy trope. The hero has to sneak out of somewhere, put him in a dress. What happened? I just got pinched in the elevator. Now you know how the other half lives. I thought it was actually a very healthy sort of representation of drag and what, what you can do it. You can have a laugh with it. It fulfills certain things for you and then you just put it away and you're still the same person. My name is Josephine. I'm Daphne. Mm -hmm. While Joe becomes Josephine, Gerald does not become Geraldine, he becomes Daphne. Jerry had Daphne inside of him all along. She was dying to come out. You must be quite a girl. <laughs> Wanna bet? <laughs> Zowie. I mean, the central joke of this movie is, is how heterosexual they are. It's not a gay movie, really, but it provides an interesting example of the way that gay people could watch mainstream films and see queer meaning in them. But you're not a girl, you're a guy, and why would a guy want to marry a guy? Security. It's a smart movie, it's a subversive movie, uh, and I think it still really holds up uh, in terms of what it has to say about men and women and men who dress as women. Get lost, will you? That's the way I like them, big and sassy. Drag is absolutely an art form. Because I think an art form is something that, in the doing of it, you transcend what it actually is and connect with people in a way that gives them a whole new set of ideas. That's what art is.
certain people just have the ability to bring a, a color to what can be sometimes a rather drab world. It is, in a way, our most transcendent spiritual kind of experience. Going to a drag performance can be like going to church. Come on, baby. Showtime. I think in the past, drag could exist as a kind of cabaret performance, but in a way, the gayness of it had to be kind of ignored or, or hidden. Positive use of drag in movies really doesn't appear, I don't think, until um, the late 70s. Do you know what it's like when a really good-looking boy looks at you and all he sees is drag queen? Outrageous is a Canadian film that stars Craig Russell, who was himself a famous female impersonator and would do specific impersonations of, you know, Mae West and other kind of legendary uh, Hollywood and Broadway divas. It is not tacky drag. I do real impressions. No records. My own voice. Well, he had a great ear. I mean, he really could do these women. And they were just coming out of him. Just, oh, he, he was great. Russell sort of typifies a, a, a particular brand of drag. You know, you see this a lot, certainly in Vegas, where there will be a whole show where it's, this guy does Barbara Streisand and this guy does Judy Garland. And there's a real skill to that, obviously, because you are called upon to be not just this sort of glamorous creation, but you have to be a very specific creation and a mimic vocally as well as uh, visually. At the cut, and um, speaking of stars, it's really nice being born a star. I think it captures not only what drag was like at that moment, but also seeing how larger gay culture interacted with drag. You see how when he comes to New York in particular, he's like performing at like the leather bars, like on the, on the west side. It really does give you a view of New York bar life in this absolutely accurate way. And you see all these men in leather jackets and mustaches doing their own kind of drag. That look is drag, it's just it's boy drag. Save your hands, boys. You might need them later. <laughs> I thought Craig Russell was amazing. And I looked up after and I saw that he won the Silver Bear at the Berlin Film Festival for that performance. And I thought, oh, that's so nice. I just was so happy that he had been properly recognized for this performance because it is incredible. Step up, kid. How's this? <laughs> what are you doing? It's for my opening. The club manager is a Betty Davis freak. And it certainly came out in a period where there was very little in the way of LGBT protagonists. It's a movie that's romantic and very sweet, and yet with this uh, rather rough edge that's quite unique. You're alive and sick and living in New York like eight million other people. You'll never be normal, but you're special. And you can have a hell of a good time. There was a brief boomlet of gay films in the early 80s. We had Personal Best and Victor Victoria and Making Love all coming out around the same time. And Victor Victoria was probably the biggest hit of them. A woman pretending to be a man pretending to be a woman? Ridiculous. I would say the interesting thing about Victor Victoria is that you see drag is something that's accessible and can be done by just about anybody. I am personally acquainted with at least a dozen men who act exactly like women and vice versa. Victor Victoria is a, a lovely farce, which is something that Blake Edwards always did really well, uh, starring his wife, Julie Andrews. She plays an out of luck light opera singer who hits upon the scheme of pretending to be uh, Poland's greatest drag queen. And all is going well until she falls in love with a gangster played by James Garner, who is taken aback by the fact that he is falling in love with this Polish drag queen. It's a guy. Yay! The ability for gender play to make people rethink uh, desire, which is exactly what's happening to him in that, is always interesting and always challenging. I think it's as simple as you're one kind of man, I'm another. It's interesting with the choice that she makes in playing a male character emphasizing the, the stillness of men. But I think it's also a really great film showing a side of life again that's where people can't really be who they are. I don't care if you are a man. 
so often for, for films that are about minority groups, we have to kind of tell that story where we are asking to be understood and asking to be tolerated and loved. And I think later we get the luxury to be angrier about things and to demand not just acceptance, but equality. But for the late 80s, you know, this is where we were. I am an entertainer. Oh, what's left of one? I go by the name Virginia Ham. Ain't that a kick in the rubber parts? Short Song Trilogy was a breakthrough Broadway play. There really hadn't been that big of a hit about gay characters, probably since The Boys in the Band. Uh, and where The Boys in the Band was about uh, people who were somewhat self-loathing, Arnold is very much the opposite. With a voice and a face like this, I got nothing to worry about. I can always drive a cab. I mean, I believe this was the first movie where the protagonist was uh, androgynous gay man, and it was all seen from his point of view. He's the hero of his own life. He is defiant in his quest for love, for respect and understanding, for parenthood, uh, for all the things that Arnold believes in and wants. He will fight for, he will get. You never trusted me enough to tell me. You never said a word. So you could have said what? Ah, he's better off dead, right? Maybe I could have comforted you. Maybe I could have told you what to expect. You cheated me out of your life! and then blame me for not being there. I mean, it's a magnificent film. i never seen anyone like Harvey. I'd never seen a performance like that. It's just heartbreaking. His great desire was to lead this tr rather traditional, conventional life as a parent and as a, a spouse. Even though he's a performer, drag's just his job. It's a, an incredible role for Harvey Firestein that he wrote himself, obviously, and that it is immortalized on film is really great. I just think it's amazing when someone can take their life and put it into a play like this. It's like sort of these snapshots of a time, of a kind of a terrible time in American gay LGBT life. It tells me you're a transsexual? Transvestite. I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right. Look, actually, I'm just a drag queen. <laughs> Drag is incredibly brave. Even within the queer community, often uh, people will criticize drag or not be into it. Yeah, well, being gay is one thing, but doing drag. The rebellion within a person that allows them to express themselves in such a crazy, you know, fun way can also lead someone to um, have a truly rebellious nature in, in wanting to see change. And I think, you know, if you look at drag in terms of socio-politically, socio drag queens have been at the forefront of the LGBTQ protest movement, and they still are. If we consider that the modern American gay movement begins with the Stonewall Riot, the Stonewall Riot happened because of the drag queens. The drag queens were the ones to sort of stand up to the police, stand up to the, you know, mob owners of the bars, and uh, insist that they weren't going to be treated this way anymore. There was just this huge kind of like the perfect drag storm. They were there. They were like, they were in the trenches. They were the, you know, the first troops went over the top. I was these more marginalized figures who were brave, who were brave enough to say, you know, screw you, don't come into my space, uh, stop attacking us. It didn't immediately end homophobia, homophobia still exists, but it showed, I think, a lot of queer people in the US and even around the world uh, that we could fight back. I think that has to be honored and appreciated when we're thinking about who drag queens are and what, what, what their sort of place is in the community. And you, Miss Davenport, Dawn Davenport. I'm a thief and a shit kicker, and uh, I'd like to be famous. People usually think, oh, when a man puts on a dress, he's being somehow softened. But it's really the opposite. Brought you a little present to remember me by. Yeah, what is it? Oh! Female Trouble is quintessential John Waters, trash, provocative, kitschy camp. And I think what it shows best is the punk side of drag. I'd like to set fire to this dump. There's the pageant, sort of beauty version of drag, but then there's also this really taboo, busting, like provocative, let me gross you out, let me be vulgar kind of drag. And you know, this is probably one of the key texts for that style. Look in the mirror, Taffy. For 14, you don't look so good. So I've written two books, one about gay movies and one about Christmas movies. And the only movie to be featured in both is Female Trouble. Uh, <laughs> the Christmas scene is unforgettable. Uh, when Divine 
throws the tree down on her parents because they didn't get her cha-cha heels for Christmas. That's just a holiday moment you never forget. You're not my parents. I hate you. I hate the doubt. I hate Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Devine plays Don Davenport and eventually not only becomes a petty criminal but becomes a uh, crime model and the idea that crime makes her more beautiful. I love crime too, especially the excitement of getting away with it! <laughs> After she is scarred in the face with acid, uh, that even that makes her more beautiful. Your face for the world to see! breathtakingly beautiful. And it, you know, it all participates in Waters as a sort of flipping of values. So ugly is beautiful, crime is beautiful, being straight is bad. If they're smart, they're queer. And if they're stupid, they're straight. Right, Ernie? I'm fascinated by Divine because her legacy is so intense and strong and famous. I mean, I see all over the place picture her image, you know, all over the world. Look at you! You're a freak! Oh, God, what's happened to your hair? Haven't you ever heard of style, Tappy? Divine was punk rock before there was punk rock, and definitely was the punk rock of drag. Waters talks about the fact that, you know, in Baltimore, that the other drag queens didn't know what to make of Divine because they were very much trying to be pretty and trying to be showgirls, and Divine was doing this sort of unhinged Elizabeth Taylor thing with, you know, crazy hair and, you know, shaving the sides of her head and big, elaborate, crazy eye makeup and really forever changed what fit into the parameters of what we think about as drag. Can't you stupid people see? I'm a huge star. I think most queens would tell you that putting the wig on is the moment that this personality or this identity emerges. The wig is often the thing that really transforms you into this other, this other character. Another way it's meaningful though is that to me the symbol of pulling the wig down and being like, all right, here I go again, I'm gonna go back out and like live my life uh, is really powerful and, and relatable. I think Hedwig and the Ang Angry Ange is the most interesting inclusion here because Hedwig is doing drag, but I don't know what that person would identify as. Yeah, it took a character assassination piece like this to make you finally pay attention. But now you're interested, huh? Some people would read Hedwig as trans. Uh, some people would uh, say something like genderqueer. But it's also about duality and about the platonic ideal and rock music. <laughs> and so there's a lot going on here. John Cameron Mitchell created this character on stage, developed the show as it went along, and he's really playing around with a lot of different ideas here. I, I saw it in the theater, but I have to say, I, I think it actually is more successful as, as a film. Uh, John Cameron Mitchell, is a, he's a wonderful filmmaker. So clever and interesting the way he, he's able to, using film, he's able to weave images of, um, of Hedwig's earlier life throughout it. Hedwig is allowed to present in a way that is more about rock and roll than necessarily male or female. Tommy, can you hear me? I suppose I think of this, the, the whole ethos of the show of being, is of we're all just trying to scrabble through. And it's good to have dreams, but it's also good to know that your dreams might not happen. The last time I saw you, we just split in two. You was looking at me. I was looking at you. Hedwig is very in between, like all kinds of things. Gender is, is a question. How she relates to men is a question. How she relates to music and her art is a question. I believe he uses the whole notion of transgender as an analogy for any kind of duality that exists in human nature. Uh, and so I think that invites the audience to relate to her in, in all kinds of ways. And I think that's why it's a, such, a, such a powerful story. When we look at LGBTQ cinema, all of those letters mean something. And I think that drag performers have played such an important role in our history. If I were a girl, and I am, I'd watch my step. They have been instrumental in making change. They have brought audiences in that might otherwise never see anything that's remotely queer. They challenge our expectations about the meaning of gender and the meaning of masculinity and femininity. Fantastic. This block of films really shows us the breadth of, kind of the drag experience in film. 
You know, there are easier things in this life than being a drag queen. They show us these lives that are so alien to ours, perhaps. Yet, yeah, they're just really the same. What makes all art great is they have an everyman and we can all relate to them. And we can all see our own lives, you know, like a mirror held up to nature. Drag queens are essential. And I think these movies uh, tell some of the best drag stories that are out there.